Hello, everybody, and a very warm welcome to Kaizen Central from Manufacturing TV. As the slide suggested, uh, we're here to discuss the life and times of Sir Clive Sinclair, lifetimes and products of this great man. Um, as the question suggests, was he a man ahead of his time, a flawed genius, a maverick, an inspiration, all of the above, and many more? I think he was a very complicated person. But also, and most pertinently, I think we want to discuss quite what lessons his experiences hold for today's manufacturers, uh, if indeed there are any, um, and to find out the extent to which any of the uh, problems he had are ones we can resolve today. Um, I'd like to um, just remind ourselves that um, although the obituaries made a lot of fun of the Sinclair C5, uh, and you'll remember, those of you old enough to remember it, uh, that strange um, vehicle, which uh, uh, if you sat in it long enough, next to a lorry, you'd probably end up as mincemeat uh, and you had to electric vehicle, but you had to pedal to go uphill. Everybody laughed about the C5, um, but it was to me very noteworthy and the Times picked up on this, that Satya Nadella, chief executive of Microsoft said, RIP Sir Clive Sinclair, your innovations democratized computing. That's interesting, you democratized computing. If anybody really did that it was Bill Gates and Microsoft and inspired so many, including myself. I vividly remember my first computer as ZX80 and the sense of wonder and empowerment I felt. It was your device that sparked my passion for engineering. And another person paying tribute was Elon Musk. Um, a lot of people have actually in correspondence about this meeting today, uh, used the word Elon Musk because people are comparing him in many ways to Sir Clive Sinclair. Not sure Elon would necessarily uh, go along 100% with that, but he just said in his rather unique style, RIP Sir Sinclair. I loved that computer. Well, it just about says everything, doesn't it? Um, and many of you also got in touch to talk about your own personal thrills uh, and experiences with a computer. Um, Bob Gibbons on uh, just now, I shall put him on the spot in a moment, but uh, I, I had a message from Graham Cooper um, from Leeds, who unfortunately, because he's uh, he's got an evening event, he can't be with us. He said, I had a ZX81 and I learned machine code programming on it, then splashed out on a 16K RAM pack. Um, 16K, wow. Um, and then we have Michael Stewart, who uh, is also on this call. So perhaps the thing to do um, is to invite, um, Michael, why don't you go first? Uh, just tell us what your experiences were of uh, of Sinclair's products and uh, how they changed your life. I, I think for for me, um, I, I'm, I'm so much younger than everybody else on this call, so I wasn't quite as exposed steady, to the computers as, as, as some of the other people that were programming on them. But uh, uh, for sure, he. he <laughs> For sure, for my, in, in my opinion, I was talking to you about it with one of my uh, friends who worked in the innovation space as well. He, he really thought that he was a, 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 a genius with the, the things that he managed to do. And probably um, it's, 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 not, it's not great that everybody remembers him for the C5. And it's like when everything, when actually he'd, he'd done so much more than that. And, and, and actually that's just one small point. But isn't that just British? Isn't that the, just the British looking for a way to knock somebody down or to pick up on something which perhaps didn't go as well as everything else and, and not celebrate all the great stuff that went before? I remember somebody once saying to me that, that you know, if you, drive a, if you drove a Bentley, not that I drove a Bentley, you drive a convertible Bentley in this country, everybody shouts at you. If you drive a good better Bentley in, in certain other countries, other people will go, good on you for getting yourself a Bentley or whatever it is. And, and maybe that's the way that it is, that we've, we've picked up on this C5 and really all the things that he, that, that he did do, you know, the calculator, the watches, the mini TVs, you know, and, and, and the things that he's continued to look at uh, have, have, have made such a, a difference to people all the way through uh, all the way through their their working lives. So yeah, I, I find him very very difficult to work out. Very difficult to work out. Um, and I, I I never met him. I, I didn't know him. Um, I was never 
you know, on, on, on shift uh, with a microphone and tape recorder um, as a young journalist would have been in those days to go and you know, catch his latest wave of publicity about whatever it is. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't work out whether he was uh, uh, just somebody who, was, who just couldn't be bothered with structures and just, you know, in that sense was a maverick and he had great ideas, but the follow through um, on some of his manufacturing, and we can get on to, to, to that in a minute, perhaps, his follow through wasn't particularly spectacular. Um, an awful lot of his products, I mean, I think I read that WH Smith's, when they bought in their stock of ZX80s, uh, they bought in 30% more than they needed so that they could cope with the returns. And um, that kind of, uh, I don't know whether that's Sinclair's fault or whether he couldn't find decent contract manufacturing to put his products in, into place. Um, and he came, he came very close to crashing and burning with the National Enterprise Board. They took a stake in him and then he walked away from it. They had to write off seven million quid of taxpayers' money. And then actually that's when he, he got going with the, with the ZX80. Let's have some more thoughts. Who else has uh, uh, experienced life? I'd like to welcome, by the way, Chris Needham, who's joining us from Innovate UK. Um, because Chris, I'm really grateful to you for coming because the, the second half or the second element of the conversation is really about nowadays what we do so well that Sir Clive Sinclair might himself have benefited from um, had you know, the, the services that yourselves provide and, and uh, other agencies of government uh, to enable people to commercialize products better. Um, but uh, in the meantime, I, Bob, I'm going to have to ask you your experience because you did something quite fantastic with the uh, uh, with, with the ZX80. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, it depends what, what what you term fantastic. But uh, my first experience of Sinclair was um, buying the the small calculator, and I bought it in Manchester. And I was on my way back home, which, which was Chalton Cum Hardy, which is about four miles south of the town at the city centre. Uh, and this thing was in reverse Polish logic, which is like double Dutch to most people. So I was kind of beginning to read it as, as I thought, as I was walking out of the shop, because it, it was a bargain, the only reason I bought it. And so I thought I'd better look for the closest bus stop because I'm never going to walk as far as I really want to get to because I want to start playing with this thing. So I found the bus stop with the number on it, 80 something it was I needed. Uh, and I still played with it. The bus came, I jumped on, went upstairs. All I had on me for that day, because I bought this dark calculator, was the bus fare home. And then I, I just got really engrossed with it. And then all of a sudden, probably 10 minutes, 15 minutes later, I looked up to find out where I was. And I was in Oldham. So, which is four miles north, not four miles south. I had no money, so I had an eight mile walk home on a Saturday. So I was very um, pleased with uh, Sir Clive, he wasn't Sir Clive then, but Mr. Sinclair at that time. <laughs> but more productively, two, two better stories are, as part of my work in at a university, I uh, stimulated probably the, not probably, it was the first flexible manufacturing system in the UK for, for Colchester Lathe Company. And that allowed you missed to win the contract to, to manage, project manage that program. So when I went and walked, worked in proper world, um, I wanted to use that program, if you like, to convince people that if we move from functional layout in our higher volume workshop to cellular layout, we could cut lead times by half and improve productivity and everything else. And the only or the best way I thought I could do it was to, to, to show on the simulation, which is probably a bit woo-woo for most people in those days, but that's what I did. Now, we had a huge um, IT department at the time, but they didn't run the computing language that, that was used for, for in, in university, which is Fortran 4. So the only thing I had was a ZX81 with a 16K pack. And so I learned the basic language which which what that used and translated the program and run the simulation and that was the thing that convinced people to make that shift the first shift they've ever thought about moving from functional to cellular manufacturing but the benefit that had was it began to wake people up to something that was different 
not just the selling and manufacturing, but computing. And we began a computer club in lunch times using ZX81s and eventually Spectrums and so forth. And lots of people began to come and play with that. And one day we were joined by someone who, who came to join us from, a, from being a milkman. And he was beginning to operate one of our uh, CNC machines, but just an operator. So he loved the computing side and he'd learned about it. So he then became a programmer. And then something like three or four years later, we embraced a thing called computer integrated manufacturing, which is a bit like industry 3.5. So it's like industry 4.0 without the cloud. We still had artificial intelligence and all sorts of wonderful things in the mid eighties, integrated the whole business through computing systems, but we couldn't get CAD to talk to CAM. And it was an IBM based system and not even IBM could do it. But the milkman worked out how to do it. And that was all because he was triggered by our computer club based on Clive Sinclair, ZX81 and Spectrum. That, that's my, my two penneth. Oh, that's a lot more than two penneth, Bob. That's fantastic. I think that's actually the, we often, you know, I'm guilty as well. We, we, we look at the, the first level of the story, but often the, the richness of uh, his legacy lies in the second and third layers um, of the things he inspired. Anybody else got any stories uh, of uh, playing with the ZX80, 81 or Spectrum? Um, of course, it, it, it is cred credibly uh, um, credited with uh, starting the very strong UK uh, video games industry because so, people, so many people sat in their back bedroom coding uh, games on these very, very uh, primitive machines. Was, any of you didn't do any back bedroom coding in those days? Uh, nobody's going to own up to that. Chris, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I, I suspect, um, like many of us, you're a lot younger than, uh, uh, than, than, than Bob and Michael Stewart. Um, <clears throat> he lied cheerfully. Um, but does Sir Clive Sinclair's legacy, I mean, before he died and before this topic was raised, did it resonate with you at all? Uh, thanks all. Uh, thanks, thanks, Nick, and pleased to join you. Uh, sorry, I'm a few moments later, I, I, I clicked on the wrong link. Uh, I, I chased it back and found, found the right, right link. Uh, keep me on my toes. Um, yeah, um, Sir Clive Sinclair, he, um, it's made me think this week. He, he's one of those people who, when the name comes up, I think, oh, I know him. And then I realised, actually, I don't know that much about him at all. Um, I know uh, some of the headline products, which is famous for being success or indeed not not a success um but uh, i've sort of uh, realized through the week through the week how much I, I don't know about him but um i do i have regularly thought of him over the last couple of years as i've um tried to get out of my bike a little bit more whenever i see a recumbent bicycle the first thing i think is oh that's like a c5 um, and i always think aren't they great i don't think oh what a failure i think it, it, it's great to have that novel solution so i i, I kind of I put it. I know, I know you have several successes, but I, I put him in the, in, in the category perhaps of someone who was maybe before his time in in, in some ways. And if he you know, take the, the, the C5, has that been in, in some way different? If it had been wider or um, better powered or, or or covered, then actually it could have had a had a different route. So um, I, I think of him as a as a as a talented in, inventor, but I realise there's so much I don't know about him. Yeah, one of the things that not many people know about him was that he didn't actually like to use computers. Um, he, 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 he didn't use the, sorry, not that, he didn't use the, it was the internet he didn't like. Um, he didn't like to have technical or mechanical things around him as it distracted from the process of invention. And he stated he didn't use computers himself, preferred using the telephone to email. And he predicted seven years ago that once you start to make machines that are rivaling and surpassing humans with intelligence, it's going to be very difficult for us to survive. It's just an inevitability. Well, you know, talking to anybody in AI these days, they'd say that he was talking nonsense. But I just think he, he does come across as something of an eccentric. But Richard Hagen, uh, I know very, very much that, that you find 
find him very inspiring. Um, and I'm, ho I'm hoping that, that uh, your dad's going to be able to join us as well and tell his story. I'll, I'll ring him up as soon as I, I finish my bit. But yes, um, my, dad, my dad was a, a chemistry teacher, then he became head of science, and they needed somebody to do with technologies in, in the late 80s or early 80s, realistically, because I was, I think, I was, late 70s. I was nine at the time, I think, when the ZX80 came out. Uh, and my dad used it as a computer, and then he took the top off it and then saw the electronics inside. At that time, he'd written a book about electronics. He was the uh, uh, chief moderator for one of the electronics uh, GCSE uh, boards. So he's very much into, uh, the, from the, the days of the transistor, uh, and he's, he's seen the whole journey, and now he's, he's 81. So he probably doesn't realise it's, it's the right hour at this moment in time. He's probably going to come on. Here. <laughs> so I'll, I'll ring him up after this. But it, it, he, he then went to London and won the award for the, the school's innovation of how to use computers. And it was basically a ZX80 that had lots of wires coming out of it. They'd written a program, and it's a three-level lift. And you could press the button to call it, and it knew which level to go to and which level then go to go up and to go down. Uh, and, and it is incredible of, of what we've managed to sort of take as a, sort of the baseline of this is what a product is, and then how people have then developed it. Uh, and and that, that's where the, so the, the innovation has gone. But certainly, Clive Sinclair has is, is, is been one of the, the, the many of, of the people who have come up with great inspiration. And that's why I think innovating, Chris being here, is, is incredible. Is There's so many great ideas, and it is about how did they get through. Richard Dyson struggled for a long, long time. Elon Musk, I was speaking to somebody on Tuesday who, who knew Elon when he was in 2010, sleeping under his desk. He is so committed to, to, to try and get it to the next level. And even he struggled. Um, with, with funding is it, it could have collapsed and it, it is about how do we get these geniuses that you've brought on so many people to actually bring it to market and get it out and yes I think Clive was a bit too early at, at the time when he brought it out but yeah I'll, I'll give me that a ring and uh, yes we'll see what happens okay that would be great Stephen Barr good evening to you Hey, good to see you all. Good to see you Chris uh, as well uh, just to, just to follow up on what uh, uh, Richard was saying there, I, I think this thing about taking risk is a crucial point, particularly with Clive Sinclair, but actually with everybody of his generation. Uh, I, I grew up uh, next to a small industrial estate and my next door neighbor was uh, an inventor and owner of one of those industrial estate units. And he, he'd invented a, a digital dice. My mother asked him, what do you need a digital dice for? You can have an actual dice. Um, he made some money out of that. It took him a while to go bust, can I put it this way? But I, it, that was kind of the style, wasn't it? You have people who were trying stuff out with electronics in the um, sort of late 70s, early 80s. And some of them succeeded and many of them, I guess, would fail. And that's a key thing I reckon that Chris has really made a difference with, with Innovate UK. Um, it, it's helping companies to get through that sort of valley of death stage with new technologies, uh, which I think my next door neighbor at the time could well have benefited from because he didn't have enough funding of his own to keep it going. So crazy ideas are important because some of them come through, but they need a lot of help to, um, to, to you know, turn things that seem crazy into things that actually everybody suddenly figures out they really need desperately. Hmm, that's a that's a really interesting point, Chris. Do you want to pick up on that because I I just find it very I I think obviously the personality of the inventor. I mean, it matters such a great deal. I wonder if Sir Clive, Sir Clive Sinclair went to the NEB for money. Of that there was no doubt, but he still wanted to run the thing, and chafed when they wouldn't let him, and so that's why it all ended in tears. But nowadays, do you think having, you know, knowing what you do about Sir Clive Sinclair, whether, whether he would have been an ideal candidate for Innovate UK funding? Um, in, in some, I, I have to confess, I've never thought of it till now. Um, in some ways, um, possibly. So um, the, the things that Innovate UK get, in, get involved in funding or, or, or the things that, that I, as the part of Innovate UK that I work for. So I work in the, um, the, the Made Smart Innovation team. So essentially that's driving innovation in digital within the manufacturing um, pool, whether that's the, the supply chain or within physical, physical factories. It's, it's about using the digital developments there. Um, 
and we're, we're, we're looking for projects that are going to be successful. But within the portfolio, we want to encourage, we always want to encourage a range of risk, because if we only fund the risky things, then we'll get little out of it in terms of things that come through the market. We'll get something, I think. If we fund things that have a really solid and robust and completely thought through plan and deployment plan and exploitation plan in the next 20 years, then that's not innovation. So there has to be a whole mix in there. And I, I, one of the phrases I, I sometimes think of is, um, um, excuse me if I paraphrase badly, but show me someone who's never failed and I'll show you someone who's never tried. And it's that process of trying something by actually exploring and pushing the boundaries that's in the, the ZX spectrum. You, you find a little something, a technique, a science, a technology, an approach, a relationship with another organization that takes you to the next thing. So I, I think it's, it's very much about that exploratory um, journey and, uh, and therefore you need a, a balance of risk taking. Mm. I, I wonder whether the pace of, uh, of change and the pace of innovation because of the incredible power that is you know, with us in, at an increasing pace itself, um, whether people get put off because you, you, could, you could spend ages trying to make something and invent something and find that somebody else has done it on the other side of the world. And, and it, it, there's just no point in trying as the lone inventor. I'm just wondering if the, if the lone inventor still exists. Do you, would you have any thoughts on that, Chris? I mean, or do you work with companies or individuals? So does it matter? So in, in my previous life, as um, uh, Mr. Barr will, will recall, so Steve and I used to work together in a, uh, a previous manufacturing program, um, then um, there were certainly some um, one-person bands or, or, or smaller organisations where we were often with, with quite interesting products. Um, I think it it re requires then a number of moons to collide for those things to come through. It has to be a, a great person with a great idea and a great deal of tenacity and probably some luck or events um, along the way. Uh, I, I have to say, I, I now tend not to get involved in those those, those smaller projects. I'm, I'm lucky enough to be involved in ones that are only uh, multiple companies. They, they can be can be small companies. Um, so I'm, I'll, um, I'll, I'll perhaps open up the questions to others about the the, uh, the, the, the single person inventors and, 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 ha and, and how they can succeed nowadays. Yeah, uh, Steve Murphy, you've got your hand up. I'm, I'm afraid when it comes to site, uh, supply of Sinclair, I'm just not a fan at all, really. Um, I'm not, I, mean, I, I don't like taking the mickey out of the C5. I, just, I thought that was just a bit, a bit off the wall. I thought I thought his calculators weren't really up to much. I bought Texas Instrument ones because they could do a proper professional job for me when I was a student. I thought his watch was an ugly looking thing. I thought it it, it, to, it totally it, sort of the like market ignorance that um, watches are fashion accessories. So why do you want this thing that looks like a small battery hanging off your wrist? It, it's it's not as smart as a Rolex. I didn't. I, I bought an IC12. That never worked very well. His, his amplifiers, I didn't. I didn't think compared well to to other other products. So, and I, th I thought he he portrayed himself to my mind too much as the eccentric genius. I thought he had a few good ideas. He didn't execute particularly well. It was a bit. It was a bit like the radio club nerd that never really got out of the sixth form. I just thought he never really grew up and started to say, well, you know, what, what do you have to do to build proper reliability into things? What do you have to do to make do proper product marketing? I don't think he ever did it. So uh, I, d I just thought he was lucky with the ZX80 and, the, and, the, uh, and those things did a really nice job of, of, of introducing programming to a lot of people. But they weren't that far in front of like the Texas Instruments computer, which was probably came out three or four years later, maybe. And I think that was much more reliable, much more sophisticated, had a lot of stuff that were only on it that were only just sort of really getting to grips with, like voice recognition and that sort of thing. 
so to my, to my mind sinclair was was one of those people who um as it were personified this picture this this lone genius or lone eccentric and and realistically a, a lot of stuff sometimes needs somebody who's a bit eccentric to to with vision to drive it but to get something that's a really good product takes a lot of focus takes a lot of um a whole range of skills with people who, who often aren't at the forefront. So while Musk is at the forefront, he's got people behind him who know how to do the nitty gritty. They know how to do technical transfer, all this stuff that needs done. I thought, I thought, I just wasn't, I just wasn't impressed by Sinclair at all. I, I, I hear that, Steve, and, and I, I fully understand that I get that because I made a point earlier about you know his manufacturing quality wasn't to the highest order. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, and you're right. I think that the the the, the computers um, were where he made his fortune, and it was on everything else that he lost it. Um, just a quick bit of uh, data for you on that. In 1982, the company had a pre-tax profit of 9.2 million pounds on a turnover of 27.6 million. Now that's not half bad. And he was estimated to have a net value of over 100 million in 1983, two years after launching the first of the ZX. Um, so, you know, I mean, clearly that he was a man who had, as you say, really struck lucky on that, but he couldn't hold on to it and develop it. But I, I would invite you, Steve, just, I, I recognize what you were saying, and I understand that you know, the, 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 the criticisms are all valid, but what, what of the view that what Elon, I'm sorry, beg your pardon, what Sir Clive Sinclair did was to offer ordinary people with low budgets, tight budgets, particularly after the 1970s, which were pretty strapped in themselves, a vision of the future and a vision of the possible. And as Bob Gibbon mentioned, it was not just a vision of, you know, what it's like to have a television on your wrist or whatever, it was actually something that changed the way we do manufacturing in this country. Is that not a fair, a, a fair alternative and more um, positive legacy, perhaps? I'm not sure. I was used to working in companies with computers, even with computers here, there, and everywhere. Um, I was used to using computers at at, um, at university, even before you know. So I was used to using mainframes and that sort of thing. Um, uh, I had teachers at school who had a, when I was 16, 17, who had a, a vision for the future involving computers. I remember the scoutmaster who was a physics cum, um, physics cum maths teacher. Um, he, he was uh, very, very instrumental in getting, getting computers into the school and making them available. So I, 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 I've got to say, so I don't, I don't agree with your point. I think there were, there were other people doing things he 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 looked he looked out with the uh, the ZX series, but um, I'm not I'm not sure a lot of that stuff wouldn't have been picked up because of the other products that were out there. I'm not sure. Okay, well, I mean that's uh... just, just just to ask, what other products were out there at the ZX eighty point? I can't actually think of the one that the Scoutmaster brought in, but we had we had one in the Scout up when I was like sixteen, which would have been. 1972. Well, if, if I can, if I can actually offer a, a, a couple of thoughts on that, there, there's an anecdote, which I'm not sure um, reflects terribly well on either of the two men involved. Um, Sinclair got out of the NEB fracas, and he and a, a, a former employee, Christopher Curry, um, developed Science of Cambridge in late 77. Um, Curry then took the design of the, um, the computer that they were working on and went and set up Acorn computers with Herman Hauser uh, in 1978. And of course, Acorn, Acorn became a very prominent name in computing in the, uh, uh, in the 80s. So there was the Acorn Atom. Um, but the thing was, it, it was the price of the ZX that was so... Um, so astounding. It was sort of 79.95 in kit form and 100 quid ready built. I mean, the, these other computers were selling for multiples of 100 pounds. And so it was that democratization to make it, put it, you know, 
in, in, in people's hands. The Acorn Atom, by the way, went on to become the BBC um, computer. And I don't know if anybody else remembers the, 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 the BBC computer. This is way, I mean, I, I, my first computer was an Amstrad. And of course it was Amstrad that bought Sinclair's business for 5 million quid. Um, so yeah, I mean, does anybody ag agree with Steve or want to come back at him on that? Yeah, Michael. I'm not in a position to be able to comment specifically on the quality of the products, but there's someone here that has a reputation and that people know whether they were about at the time or not. And I just think that these people drive innovation forward, whether their product ultimately is the best that comes forward. Are they not just consistently pushing the boundaries and looking for ways to do things better? And and I'm not sure that the the there's a uh, a congruence necessarily always between the creative genius, if we want to say that, or the person that innovates, and then the person that that can run a business in a in a in a truly rounded and strategically strong way is there always a, a fit between those two things and so you know I think I think the fact that we're having a conversation about him is is that there is a, a, a relevance to him within yeah. within all our, our 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 psyches if you like and and so that would that, that's the only thing that that I would say and when I, when we're thinking about this I was just thinking about what well, you know we see you talk about innovation. We see the fashion designers and we see what walks down the catwalk in Milan and we go, goodness me, is anybody ever going to wear this stuff that Jean-Paul Gaultier creates or whatever? But bits of it see that find their way into fashion and, and we're all wearing them now or whatever it, it would be, just the, the style of it in a watered down sense. And like you say, these people push the boundaries and elements of it, then fall into something else and drive an innovation somewhere else, don't they? So it's just a, a natural well, a natural process. It's just the way of things in, in to my mind. I think what Steve has put forward in terms of the weaknesses or whatever of, of the Sinclair products and approach and so forth are all very valid points. The other point is that if you were a technical specialist, then there were other alternatives. I know in our technical department, okay. they, they, they wouldn't bring these things, but the things I'm talking about, they were home computers. They weren't, they weren't for industry and so forth. You know, we in our technical department, we would use TI and so on. Um, uh, and the first, I think, home type computing that they got in that was then Acorns and 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 whatever it was that, that came on after that. But as a home computer, it was something that that to me at that point in time that was the only one that uh, it was the the first, if you like, that seemed to be publicly available or promoted. And that's why I think it, it made such a difference. After that, there were a ton of them that, that were probably a f far better. And, and eventually, I don't know what was about 82, 83, um, obviously PCs came out. So the whole world changed then. So I think Steve's absolutely right in terms of, it wasn't a great um, lesson in manufacturing system, you know, developing a, a business out of it. But all I could share was as a user, it made a huge difference to, to me and the business I worked for. Yeah, Chris Needham, a, a couple of times people have mentioned on this call, the, the fact that it's one thing to have a brilliant idea and innovative creation and all that, but unless you've got the mindset and the, the people either with you or you've got innate business skills, you've got to have that business um, backing to make it uh, business skills backing, not just finance. To what extent do you at Innovate UK actually sort of try to ensure that there is that business skills underpinning of projects that you, uh, that you support? Sorry, Chris. Yeah, there we go. Someone had to, didn't they? So. <laughs> it, it's done now. I've done it. No one else needs to do that joke. Um, 
I'm sure we can do a lot more in, in that sense. I think the what I, I found fine with um, funding vehicles for projects, just, just my own experiences. Um, part part of it, it, it's about the it's about taking people and, and something they might do next year, maybe, and using the funding to actually definitely do it and do it now. And I I, I think. Um, one of the one of the key things is is about when you put time constraints on things, it forces people to to find a solution. Um, so I think that that's that, that that's a critical aspect. And then when you when people then need to find a solution, it forces them to identify what the other gaps are, whether it's skills, um, and then they can go and find those skills often through one route or another either we or some other great organisations out there can, can signpost to it. But what has to come before the skills is the recognition that I need to do something, understanding what that gap is, and some time driver to do it. Some people are wired to, um, to, you know, to find those gaps for themselves and, and some are not. So um, I, I, th I think it's about that call to action, which is the, the critical thing that, that, that funding brings. Um, together with the, the providing the links into partners who may have those skills. When it comes to individual skills with it within a business, I, I, it's not something that we're best placed to support on other than to um, perhaps signpost when it becomes uh, apparent. But there are, you know, there are great um, other support networks out there, consultants, uh, et cetera, who can provide that shot in the arm to businesses that do need skills. And I'm, I, I find uh, comparisons with other countries invidious because uh, somebody will always say we're world leading and uh, I will, my eyes will glaze over when they start saying that. But uh, we have had a particularly difficult time in this country of um, navigating what Stephen Barr described as the valley of death, which is the commercialization of good ideas. Chris, do you think that we're 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 getting better at it as a as a as a nation? Do you think that we're 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 beginning to um, to get this right, or, or are too many ideas still left by the wayside? Um, I'm 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 blown away by what I see um, in in the vast majority of the projects that I'm lucky enough to to be involved in. Um, I'm um, blown away by the the ideas that organisations have, the, the passion to keep going through all the trials and tribulations of a standard year, let alone the the, the year and a half we, we we've all had. Um, so I'm I'm not worried by a, a dearth of ideas, um, and I'm constantly impressed by people's ability to find ways to um, to 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 overcome challenge technical challenges, commercial challenges. Um, and, and look for the future and try and find a way to bring things through. So for the, the here and now, I'm, I'm not concerned. Um, whether it's greater or less uh, opportunity than the past, um, Michael Stewart's older than me, uh, we've all learnt, so he may be able to <laughs> advise what the past was like. <laughs> OK. He's, uh, that's, 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 he's gone now, he's walked out, that's terrific. It looks um, like he's walked into a wardrobe, to be honest, but... <laughs> John Hagen, um, I, I hope you can turn your camera and your your, your microphone on because we'd love to hear from you about your experiences. Um, Richard's been telling us about uh, about what you've uh, what you did as a teacher. Um, I wonder if you could uh, just come and tell us what these early forays into computing meant to you. Is the camera on now? Not not just now. We can hear you though, John. All oh. oh, right. I thought it says it says video on. Um, not to worry, not to worry. We'd be lovely to hear from you. Right. Um, with uh, Clive Sinclair, he started, I believe, uh, selling transistors, germanium transistors, of which I bought some from him, uh, and built a little unit to uh, find the HFEs and sort of graded them uh, and then rebuilt uh, amplifiers, basically. Uh, this, my, my interest really with uh, 
computing came through electronics. That's my real interest. Uh, so in the early days, I built uh, simple um, computers. And when the ZX80 came out, we piggybacked the, the memories and made it from the 1K, which it was originally when you bought it, uh, into about uh, six, I think it was about 6K. So in those days, the programming, which was basic language, uh, you had to be fairly careful about it. And it was fairly um, difficult to do very much. When the ZX Spectrum came out, uh, we did quite a lot of uh, additions to it and made it uh, control other things. In fact, Mullard had a competition, a uh, school competition, and we went to London and I've, oh, you don't have, a, I have a photo here uh, where we took, made a, a clock, a digital clock with um, LEDs on the outside uh, and inside for the hours and the, set and the minutes. We also had a lung pressure gauge where you blew down a tube and it spun uh, a wheel and it counted the pulses and you can uh, find people's lung pressure. So we, we built sort of one or two interesting things like that. Wow, the Archimedes, then the Archimedes, the Acon Archimedes, uh, we did a lot with that. Um, but that, of course, wasn't Sinclair, so I'll keep up that. Well, I, I, John, you were a, a pioneer in your own rights, and um, uh, it's little that, wonder. <laughs> it's little wonder that you produced uh, um, a son as inspiring in his own way as Richard, uh, who's uh, doing magnificent things with crystal doors. So, uh, um, what a family! Brilliant stuff. Thank you. Um, I, Stay with us. Steve Murphy, you've got your hand up. No, I was, uh, uh, I think there's a couple of comments to say, you know, how are we doing nowadays? And I, I think, um, I think nowadays in terms of invention and innovation and, and, and even trying to get good things to market, we are doing, we are doing much, much better in the UK than I ever remember when I was a lad. I mean, we've, we've, we, I think the universities are much, much more tied to not just doing uh, good basic research, but, but being able to move research into products. And there, there are mechanisms there to do that. You think that there's companies like the Plastic Semiconductor Company, Pragmatic up in the Northeast. You know, you've got all the silicon carbide companies. You've got the guys who do the, um, all, the, all the hetero junctions down in Cardiff. I think I think the 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 the, 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 the sort of joined up thinking between in invention and you know concept and invention and getting it to a real product is is much much better than it ever used to be in this country. I'd still like to see more of it, but um, when I when I was younger, I just I just couldn't could not see that link up. It just didn't seem, everything seemed to be siloed. Now I, I seem to think those silos between having a good idea, doing some research and turning that research into products, is, it still takes a long time, but I still think it's, it's better supported by government and I'd still like to see it done better. But I think we're, we're definitely moving in the right direction in this country, in, in that area. Am, am I right in thinking that we all, am, am I right in thinking, okay, that there is a difference between invention and innovation? I mean, is that a correct statement to make, that invention is different from innovation? Innovation improves something, is a new way of doing something, but an invention is a whole new product. Okay. Is, is that right? I mean, is, am, am I right? In, uh, do people agree? I've, I've got a thumbs up from Lee Howarth there, I, I'm hoping that was intended. Now, the reason is, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I think that the, um, for instance, Steve Lindsay at Lontra um, uh, with, with the blade compressor. Now, that is, that's an invention. Um, that's a, a completely new way of developing a compressor. 
Um, and you know, he's he's built that business and he's he's got backing and he's taking it where it needs to go. But that's different from an innovation, which um, is equally important, of course, you know. But uh, um, <clears throat> I just think that uh, I have to agree with Steve that the 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 dreadful word ecosystem is so much friendlier today. Uh, I just wonder how Sir Clive would have uh, would have fared, whether he'd wanted even to share um, in not necessarily the money, it's the ideas. I think he felt that he had all the ideas that were necessary and it would just require people to work for him and put it into practice. Um, and those who like Sir Clive might find that a little harsh judgment. Um, I, I wonder what we need else to do in this country are there any practical steps we could make towards making either invention or innovation um not just easier it's never going to be easy it's probably one of the toughest things to do but perhaps more rewarding i remember um um i've forgotten who it was a member of the, of the group said that in america um universities for instance get to keep 100 percent of the ip of any projects that they're involved in. Uh, and that is a great incentive, or it really incentivizes university research and departments to produce some amazing products because of course they get to keep the IP. And so when they spin it off, they end up having very successful companies because they, they put it all together instead of sharing it with government which is what I think happens over here. Chris, is, am I correct in that, Chris Needham? Am, am I correct in saying that in this country, if a university um, uh, you know, creates some IP around an innovation or invention, they, uh, but it, and they receive government funding to help them do that, they have to share the, the, uh, the, the IP with the government? Um, to, to be honest, I, I, I can't answer that question. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you for why. Um, the, my, my exposure is um, really at the, the, the higher technology readiness or the medium to higher technology readiness levels. Um, if we talk about a scale of one to nine in the sort of the, the four to eight, four to nine levels, so the, the higher levels. And the projects that I get exposure to are um, uh, business led collaborative um, projects. So that that model wouldn't fly there because no, no business would get involved in it if someone else is going to going to take the IP. So um, what the, the, the projects are, I'm involved in, which is typically projects of value between about 200,000 and, and 10 million pound projects. Um, very definitely the, the, the IP is either split across the or in some way shared out across the collaborative, the collaborative partners. Um, one thing I was I was going I was so, so therefore the, the the academics are not incentivized to uh, now to, to be able to to to, to keep that. Um, one thing I, I think um, and again I mentioned before something I was blown away by in, in, in the projects I get to see, but another is the the level of of sharing, um, and it, it reminds me that the more that one shares with others, yes, there's a risk that you're going to lose. But there's kind of an unwritten risk that you might actually gain something as well. And that as you share your knowledge and collaborate with others formally or informally, um, you can also, if you can share one idea with the 10 people you're working with, you're in a position then to pick up the ideas and experiences of those 10 other organisations. Um, uh, and and uh, I think sometimes that, that IP knowledge sharing opportunity is, is missed. We, we often think about what we might lose rather than what we might gain. So I, I think that's, that's brilliant, uh, a, a brilliant aspect of the collaboration things I've been involved in. And we're just in the bit of a, a heads up advert time coming up, but uh, the team I work in, we're just in the process and later on this year, we'll be launching a, a large fund uh, focused on smart manufacturing, um, but um, uh, sustainable, um, improvements. So improvements within factories using digital that will either A, reduce energy consumption within manufacturing processes, or B, reduce material losses, material waste, material consumption within manufacturing processes. And one of the things that we'll be in encouraging there is, is, is collaboration and sharing of ideas, because getting great people together, guess what, you get even better ideas. Well, Chris, I see a lot of nodding around the uh, around the room. I, I think that uh, 
it's the thing that has struck me most um, in the years that uh, I've been sort of in, in the sector, observing the sector, being part of the sector, if you like, is the degree to which the most ambitious and the most adventurous and most successful companies are prepared to share thinking and to collaborate. I think collaboration um, has come across as a very, very powerful um, tool for people to, you know, to embrace and, and, and not st stay in their ruts. Having said that, I'd like other people to, to talk about that and whether, uh, Stephen Barr, you've got your finger up. Yeah. Yes, I'm not sure I'm quite going to answer that question exactly, but just, just, just on this point of um, innovation, it's, it's a contrast really with Clive Sinclair, going back to that as, as a theme here. Um, he, he is said to have been you know, skilled as an engineer, um, skilled as a marketeer, a genius in some respects, but actually that, that is incredibly rare. So I, I think these days in particular, it's really hard for individuals you know, with bright ideas uh, to get as far as being commercially successful and sustainable as a business into the future. All of the businesses that I've worked with that have come up with ideas have needed to work with other organizations, whether they are other technologists or other marketing organizations or you know, mere, mere consultants like myself. That, that seems to be the normal thing, particularly in the modern world. And if it's the and normal that's thing, then the we ought to do more. Universities can't give you. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and that is for me, Steve. It's absolutely the nail on the head for me. That's something the universities can't give you. Mm. And this is where I have this. I have this bone of contention around how we tend to give the money to the university to deploy that across into how we take a business into that digital marketing side, that element. But the university isn't the place to be doing it. There are other organizations that are far better placed in dealing with that distribution of money to make that um, innovative product and service better and back into the consumer and back into the into what we want. And this is where I think we're a bit we are very, very much misaligned. I mean, I'm sitting here listening to around around um, next year or when it is that we're going to look at the energy and what we can do with digital manufacturing around uh, tackling energy factory iq we already do that now i've made a, I've, I've i've just been, been talking to others i made a, an approach to made smarter over two months ago two three months ago said they'd give me a call still waiting i am from that point of view so our digital marketing you know in when i look at our digital factory iq when i look at it we can actually analyze what's happening on the machine and ghost that over the production plan they say the production plan to see where we actually see the gaps of the hidden factory, which I don't think there's anybody else doing currently. Yet we are st we are battling all the time. So in the end, we've turned around and said, right, we'll do it on our own. Well, let's go. So I'm quite. I, I for me, there is there is a lot of uh, misalignment in everything that we're trying to do, uh, and we need, as Stephen says, there are organisations out there that help us take things to market and they're better placed instead of all the time filtering it through a university. Universities have their, their area of expertise, but it's not the be all and end all, and they shouldn't be controlling it. It should be controlled elsewhere, but that's my opinion, that is. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, I think the, 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 the links between academia and UKRI uh, and the catapults, and they all, they all sort of, come together and they all have a part to play. It's just making certain that those channels are as wide open as possible. Um, yeah. And it's encouraging to hear, sorry, Adam, you're gonna- Yeah, but it's because, it's because we miss, there are, there are, there are, I've seen innovation out there, loads of innovation out there, and, and there's stuff that can have a massive impact, but they miss because they don't probably hit that high value, high potential, high growth threshold, but they could. And that's the thing with the right organization, like Steve was saying, with the right backing, right organization, they could and they could make a massive impact. Uh, and unfortunately, we're missing it. Are you saying that we require an, an, another layer and you know, a, a different layer in, in, in the in the in the infrastructure? I think we need to broaden our, 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 our view instead of just sort of like saying we're going to look at this high value high growth capability which is like 
the needle in the haystack side. If we started to broaden our view more, we might be and put into place the mechanisms that allow us to get those uh, innovations moving. It would be, I think, we'd have a phenomenal impact. Uh, it's because you know the people don't know what they don't know, uh, and there is some of that going on. Um, you know, so I think we just need to broaden our horizons a little bit more, uh, open it out a little bit more, instead of just looking for that. We talked about risk earlier, that limited risk of, or you know, the uh, damage limitation. Whereas if we opened it out a bit for, and we took it took a little bit more risk. I mean, my mentor says to me, if you don't risk uh, risk anything, you risk everything. I put it in the chat. Um, you know, it's you just got to open it out a bit more. For me, that's that's it. I mean, I'm a, I'm, I get wound up around it because I've been on the receiving end of it, and in the end, I've just turned around and said, right, I'll give up. I'll just, I know that I know because our product is being bought, you know, and, and is going. So I'll just carry on. I'll just, I'll just uh, keep going. Um, so yeah, it is, it is, it is a shame because there are other uh, things out there. There are loads of of seeds that can grow, um, you know. I, I, I recognise uh, no system is ever going to be perfect for obvious reasons. Chris, Chris Needham, you've got your hand up. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to pick up on uh, some of the some of the great points you, you raised there, Adam. So um, I. I, I work in um, a team that's part of the, I don't like the word movement, but um, the, this national made smarter movement. Uh, there are different strands to it. Um, the, there's a, an adoption strand, which um, is uh, there to, um, let's say, support on technologies that are currently out there, for want of a better phrase. I work not in that area. I work in the innovation team and our job is to work with organizations great and small to try and help bring through new things. Um, I, I absolutely um, uh, accept there's different ways we could do it and better ways we could do it and faster ways we could do it. But one of the things we do is we have um, four or five different, um, different vehicles, some of which are focused very much on the research end of things. So um, academic led it's not an area i'm involved in but that 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 area and early stage ideas the the next next generation if you like or the embryonic ideas we have um, other solutions that are focused at the uh, at the closer to market end but not at market end they're ideas that have been proved to a point but need industrializing so this is typically collaborative r d projects and we, we also increasingly have things in, in between there. So, um, for example, we're um, in the process of rolling out some testbed or innovation hub vehicles that allow SMEs to be able to um, trial and test things such as in, interoperability of their, their digital technology with different systems on the market. So I, I, I agree that there are, there are different, um, different ways we need to um, to, to bring things through um, and I personally think that having things that spreading that risk and spreading that maturity approach and having th having um, funding in this case and collaborations targeted at different di uh, at different areas ranging from university led to entirely business led it is a decent way of approaching it. Adam you've mentioned that you you'd put in a call to someone um, if you let me know that who that is, I'll follow up. I, I suspect it's not my organisation, um, but um, regardless of what it is, if you want to drop me some notes in the chat about who you spoke to, I will see if I can help you out there. Well, where are you based, Adam? I'm based Warwickshire, Leicestershire border. Me and you have spoken before, Chris, when you're at uh, MGP. I, I recognise you. I recognise your name. Yeah. So I'm. I'm. I'm I'm, I'm guessing it's that other program I, I, I spoke about, but um, I don't have many contacts there, but I'll see what I can do. Yeah, most people know Adam's face from post office walls, but uh, that's um, that's his baby. <laughs> Listen, uh, it's seven o'clock. In fact, it's just gone. I just want to thank John Hagen so much for coming on board. I want to thank Richard Hagen for introducing us to his dad. Inspiration, John, you're more than welcome anytime 
any Thursday at six o'clock. If you just want to come and get, listen to chats like this, take part if you like. Um, I'm very happy to include uh, include your email address on the uh, uh, on the weekly emails. Richard, congratulations on your new book, uh, which you I can see behind you. You went to Westminster Abbey the other day to collect it. There it is. Hey, what does that say? Leadership. I can't see it because of the, the strange blurry thing. Um, but also you won an, uh, an award the other day as well. So for Crystal Doors uh, on the sustainability front, there we are. What's the, the 200 years of leadership and innovation or is it 100? I can't see. It's 300 years of leadership. So we've had the, the parliament now for 300 years. So one of the books is all about uh, the, the history of uh, the people that used to rule the country. Uh, and then the new book has got a lot of manufacturers in it, uh, including myself uh, and other companies, which is to do with sustainability, innovation and leadership. But obviously 300 pages per book is uh, a breathtaking book to uh, obviously be included in. So an absolute privilege. Um, uh, uh, I'm at COP26 for 90 seconds to the world leaders under uh, Nigel Tipping, um, talking with the United Nations uh, Global Compact to do with SDGs uh, for the Manchester Virtual. Um, I'm talking with O2 and the British Chamber next Thursday uh, at two o'clock. So I, I'm, I'm certainly trying my best to get out there to show that sustainability is possible and it's fun and that's what it's about. And it's the same with digital transformation and it's evenings like this that uh, obviously inspire us all and so well done to you, Peter. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the, uh, the congratulations. All right. Well, bless your heart. Well done. Thank you, everybody. Um, Chris Needham, a special thank you to you. I know you're incredibly busy, but uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us tonight. Uh, this has been Kaizen Central from Manufacturing TV. We're here six o'clock every Thursday evening. Um, come rain, come shine. Uh, so do join us again. Thank you for being with us.